Hello, welcome to our uh, charge over mass, electron charge over mass lab, which is E over M. We talked about in the class that you cannot, just from the Thomson experiment, that's what we're going to do today, you cannot measure the electric charge of an electron or the mass of an electron separately. You have to find out mass of an electron through another experiment like Millikan's oil drop experiment and then combine it with this experiment and then find out the electric charge of an electron. But that was done. So we have already used a cathode ray tube. Remember that uh, in our, uh, a few weeks ago, and what we had here is you had a deflecting electrode here and you had an accelerating electrode here so that when electrons are emitted from this filament and the filament had you know some kind of uh, power source so that and these electrons would be accelerated in this medium right here so this is the electron and if I have positive here and negative here it would actually be attracted to the positive side and the amount of energy that goes in there we said was, if you consider that to be a V1, which is my accelerating voltage. So the energy that the electron gains would be simply E V1, where V1 is the accelerating voltage. And we know this will be equal to the kinetic energy of the electron, which is half mv squared. So they, this will give the electron some velocity. So let me just write down here E over m lab so that we have some idea of what <clears throat> the lab is about. But once the electron comes to the deflecting voltage, let's say it's y or something like that, we apply an electric field here and the electron would actually either go up or go down. Let's say it kind of goes down. If it goes down, it means that I'm implying an electric field like that, right? It goes from positive to negative. And the electron itself, <clears throat> it literally feels a force opposite to the electric field and the force will be Fe force due to the electric field and that is the charge of the electron multiplied by the electric field itself. Now you can figure out what the electric field is if you know this E field will be simply the voltage that I'm going to apply here and I'm trying to remember what voltage we actually we mentioned. It could be V2, let's call it V2 and V2 over uh, remember that volts per meter is my uh, unit of electric field. So if this is D and the voltage difference between them is V, then if I simply take the voltage difference and divide by the distance, I actually get the electric field. I take the electric field, multiply by the electron charge, and that gives me the force, which is in Newton, right? So the idea of today's lab is we're going to now apply a magnetic field in the system, and this magnetic field will actually create a force on this electron, but in the opposite direction, so that if I can displace the electron from its central line, I'm going to apply magnetic force so that it will go back to its original position. What does that mean? It basically means that I am, I have an equilibrium force which is that way. <laughs> Sorry, this doesn't work. Maybe I'll get a better pen here. It's not much better, but you might still get that. And this one, if this is Fe, I'm going to get an Fb. We'll try 
lots of them. <laughs> One of them will work. Uh, so this would be, and this doesn't work at all. <laughs> all right, sorry about that. <laughs> we'll get, get back to our trusty, uh, the original one. So FB, B for the magnetic field. And you know that you take the charge and the velocity of the electron multiply by the magnetic field. Now remember originally what, what, that, what that force is. The original of the force was E, which is the charge, or Q, sometimes we use Q. U, V cross B, that's a cross product, right? That's a cross product. Now remember the electron velocity. Electron velocity is this direction, which is V, okay? And I want my force, in this case, to go upward, okay? My force upward. Now, this is an electron. If it was a proton, the force would be downwards. So let me just imagine this is the proton, the force is downward. V cross B should give me a downward force. Basically, what happens here is that the downward force is that way, V cross B, that means that my magnetic field, if I take, it's a right-hand rule, if the velocity of the proton, imagine this is a proton, I'll just, uh, <clears throat> what you call it, I will make it a mirror image later on. So the proton is going there, V cross B, and the, if the magnetic field is coming out of the board, okay, so this is magnetic field is coming out of the board, which would be like that, it's like an arrowhead coming out of the board, this is magnetic field, so V cross B and the proton direction will be that. If the proton direction is downward, electron direction will be upward. That's what that cross product does, right? That's my, so that means that as long as my B field is coming out of the board and the electron is going that way, it will experience a force upward like this. So in this case, I have my electric field going up like that. The B field is actually coming out of the board. And that's what we need when you will do the experiment. All right, so what happens now? Well, I'm going to manipulate my electric field and magnetic field in such a way that this thing comes back, the electron beam comes back to the center position again. First, I will apply electric field, bring this down, the beam, and then I'll apply magnetic field, I'll increase the voltage and you will see how that works in such a way that it comes back to this original position. So in this case, what happens now? I have if magnetic field force equals the electric field force. So what I have is EVB equals E E. Okay? All right. So you can see right away that V equals simply E over B. Actually speaking, if you, if from Maxwell's uh, equations, you can actually show for light actually that uh, C equals E over B or E is simply CB where C is the velocity of light. But that's a different issue. We're not dealing with that. Uh, this is, this is not really a Maxwell's equation. We are talking about electron particles and not, nothing to do with uh, electromagnetic wave. But V equals E over B. And if I know that velocity, it with respect to the mass and the electron uh, mass and the electron charge, I can actually uh, figure out what E over M should be. E over M should be. I know, elect I know these two, actually. I know these two. So let me go back to my original one. Let's look at over here. What's happening there? Well, right from there, you can see I can solve right here. I can solve V equals 2EV1 over M, right? I just solve for V. I just plug that in here, which is 2EV1 over M. All right, I square both sides, E square over B square equals 2EV1 over M. And so 
e over m is nothing but your uh, e squared stays the same, and 2v1 over b squared. All right. So what I will do after the end of the lab, I'll come back and for e, e what I'm going to give you for e, uh, for e, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, remember what e is. e is basically v2 over d. So I need to give you v2, I need to give you d. For b, there are two ways I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you b directly, but also we're going to use a solenoid solenoid and the solenoid magnetic field at the at least at the center of the solenoid is mu naught n i n is the number of windings okay n is the number of windings and mu naught is magnetic permeability we know that so we think this is what we think is I want you to find out, find out the number of windings. This is a separate um, question. I'll give you B, and you need to find out what is N, okay? N. And I counted on the top of the solenoid, you will see that um, on the top surface, Seventy-five windings. You'll see what, what I mean. But you have it's more, much more than seventy-five. It could be seven hundred and fifty, for all you know, or maybe five hundred. So you have to kind of, from that, you kind of find what n is, and then um, divide that by seventy-five. Then you can get the number of layers. So find out the number of windings and number of layers. Okay. All right, so, and then when you do all this stuff, your E, you actually find out from that. Your B, I'm going to give you B directly. Uh, and then uh, your V1 is also, I make, this is the accelerating voltage. I'll go, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you that. Okay, and then this V2 is the uh, deflecting voltage. I'm going to give you that. And also the D, I'm going to give you that also. I don't know whether you remember from your, the lab we did with the, just the catheter tube, that D was about four millimeter, okay? Uh, so I think that once you derive it, E over M, I want you to compare it with the real E over M and find the fractional difference, okay? I find the fractional difference with respect to the theoretical E over M. So literally you have only two things that you need to do. One is do this. The other one is over here, okay? So I'll just, um, because I'm not going to the board, uh, I'm not going to use um, write-up today. It's a very simple thing. And then I want you to uh, also do this part, okay? So these are the only two things that we need to do. Uh, I hope that this is also understood. Uh, as you know that this particular thing was not only used in CRT tubes, but if you look at a mass spectrometer, and the mass spectrometer actually uses this quite a big, uh, you know, uh, quite well, uh, quite extensively. We'll talk about that in the class. And there are several other, um, actually, physics uh, experiment, and uh, also in real life, the, this method is, is used. So I will... Um, finish it here, and the next step would be uh, to go over and do the experiment. We can do this uh, right away if you want, okay. Yeah. All right, 
So this one uh, is our experiment right here. We have, uh, uh, we have a number of things, so let me just introduce you to, to what I have here. Uh, the first thing is, uh, this is the, uh, what you call it, the power supplies for the cathode ray tube. This is my cathode ray tube. We used it last time, right? And <clears throat> there are three bias voltages here. We call it bias voltage. One is for the filament that actually produces the electron from the back of the cathode ray tube. One is there for the accelerating voltage, it should be 500 or 600 volts. <clears throat> and the third is also the deflecting, uh, the deflecting voltage, right? Um, let me, oh, here it is. Uh, this was the, I showed you this last time. This is what the skeleton inside the cathode ray tube. And the deflecting voltage, this is, you can imagine this for the Y, that's for the X. And the accelerating voltage is applied over here. Bunch of wires from the back for those voltages. And, um, and then the electron is shoot out from the filament, gets accelerated, and then gets deflected. And you get these, um, it, it hits a phosphorescence material and it actually emits, uh, that, that green basically the material actually, it's not the electron color of course understood. It basically comes from the material which is being used and that actually emits maybe about 500 nanometer or so. That's why we see it in green. Um, so over here I have it, um, I have it uh, all the way to 600, 617, 617, 617 volts. That's my V1. Let me write it down. I will write. So V1 is 617 volts. Okay. And I can focus it. Also, the focusing is done with the X and Y. And more or less, it's in the center. I'll consider it to be at the center. Okay. All right. So, so that's one thing. So this one is nothing new on that. So if I now deflect it, so, sorry, I should turn it off. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, more or less in the center. Let me take it for the center, I'm satisfied with it. Not exactly at the center. I had to turn it around to get both for the magnetic field force and the electric field force oppose each other, so I think that would be okay. Now let's look at how I'm going to, um, sorry, let me just uh, show you. I'm show you that this one goes down, see that? When I apply electric field on it, it goes on all the way down right there, and that I'm applying, let's say, uh, 46 volt, okay? 46 volts. So my V2 is 46. I might change it later a little bit. Let's just at least let it be for the time being. Now is the other part, magnetic field. I have another power supply. It's also a DC power supply. And what I have done is I have connected it in the positive and negative side. This is my solenoid. So these are the coils. Remember, they're kind of insulated coils and they're wrapped around. And uh, what I have here is, uh, I don't want to move this right now because this takes a little bit of, um, all right. So you can see that it's uh, kind of empty inside. Um, and you know from our class, maybe I have covered it by this time, that if I pass current in the outside, it will create a magnetic field inside. This is a magnetic field probe and it actually can sense magnetic field in two directions. One is the XL direction, and then perpendicular to the XL direction both ways. And we have set this up already here. Uh, well, I'm going to increase this. So, so right now, it's, this, it's a little bit higher than what we expect. Uh, this 1.2 Gauss is kind of in this direction. And remember, that's the north side is over there. So you kind of expect that north-south direction 
you'll have a little bit higher uh, magnetic field, even though it kind of dips down, okay? So it's kind of dipping down like, as such like this. But anyway, um, it's a little bit higher than what we expect. This 0.5 or 0.6 Gauss is basically what uh, the magnetic field of the Earth is. Um, and remember, 10 to the power 4 Gauss is 1 Tesla, 10,000 Gauss is one Tesla. When you go into MRI machine, you're talking about two, three, four Tesla. So this is a really low Gauss. There could be other magnetic field created by lots of different things here in our room. Any electric current will create magnetic field. So, so what happens that now we will try to turn this on. And I want you to notice that, that beam right here. I have, before the lab started, I tried to make it such that <clears throat> the magnetic field, which remember that comes out um, over there, is comes out of the board, and the velocity of the electron is directly right that. This one is coming out of the board, and the velocity of the electron is that way, so the force would be upward. So let's see if that's true. Uh, I'm going to get the voltage, so, and I'm going to increase the voltage and remember, the magnetic field is mu naught times n times the current for the solenoid. And I'm going to gradually increase the voltage and see if it comes up. It does come up. So my orientation is correct. So the electron is going that way. Magnetic field is going that way. And if I <clears throat> V cross B, uh, <laughs> actually V um, cross B, it, it will work, okay, let's not worry about it. We, I will refer to you to that way. It does go up, all right, see that? So, so this, is, this is my zero voltage, and <clears throat> the FB is pointed downwards, and then I apply the magnetic field on it, and gradually, as you can see, as I increase the voltage, I bring it back to the center. It may not be exactly at the center, but for our purposes, it will work. Um, I'm only applying, this is really amazing, I'm only applying, um, it's, sorry, it's, it's, a magne it's a current that I need. I'm only applying um, current of 0.96, so it's about one amp current. I'm applying about one ampere current to it. My voltage is uh, only one volt, but my current is what is important because you need to figure out whether it makes sense with the current in the end. So it's about one amp current, I brought it back. What I want to do right now is actually give you a real magnetic field. Um, so I want to tear it, it means that it's basically, it prevents the outside magnetic field to go in there. It's, called, it's kind of made of like mu metal, it has some aluminum and other stuff. And I press it tear, see that it kind of goes to zero, but not, it's still there are some leaking in here, but that's good enough for me. And as you can see right now, everything changed what we had before, so it wasn't calibrated before, right? So I go in here, and as you can see that the field, it, it actually is very high at the center, up to 40, and then it drops. So right up here, I'm going to assume that, let me just do it right here, okay, and then I want to increase it slightly to bring it back right there. So actually it's 1.23 amp turns out, 1.23 amp, and it's, you see that how it's a little bit farther out, so I have to use over here, it's not, not that field, it's 50 Gauss right there, but it's not experiencing 50 Gauss. It's experiencing more or less, it's symmetric on both sides. It's more or less experiencing right here, it's about 10 Gauss. So let me write down about 10 Gauss. I'm just, I want to make sure that what I have here, it's, it's not exactly 10 Gauss, it's a little bit lower, but then you can see that there is a component on the bottom also, and uh, I would 
take that into account. You have to square both of them and find out the total magnetic field. I'll go with the 10 Gauss, not rocket science. Don't use these numbers to send man to the moon, all right? So, so this will work. Um, this particular thing works with the Hall effect, and uh, we'll talk about the Hall effect in, the, in, in, in our class, that how you can actually, uh, you can put a certain voltage over here and measure also the vo voltage difference on the other side. It kind of works also like that, actually, the way I described it in the electric field force and the magnetic field force balances each other. And um, so this is a good device, actually, for, to measure magnetic field. Um, usually, very high magnetic field doesn't affect us that much as the electric field does. So let me go over to the board and write this down, um, what we needed. I was going to give you uh, the V2, which I wrote down here. I think it's, um, it was 46 volts over here, right? Um, that's actually, I lost that monitor, but uh, I good that I wrote this down earlier. And the, the deflection, the D is actually, I measure the distance between the electrodes. It's about four millimeter right there. I had uh, done this when we were doing the, the, the CRT lab. Uh, so I have those. And I think I got everything more or less what I needed. Um, so let me go over to the board and rewrite those things down separately. Um, let me write it out here again one more time. So our V1 is 6.17 volts. This is the accelerating voltage, remember that. And the deflecting voltage, V2, was 46 volts, okay? And then to D, D I need is four millimeter, which is four times 10 to the power minus three meter, right? And then B, we used 10 Gauss. Also, I want you to kind of figure out how many windings there are. So the solenoid I might have, I think there is, I think that's an E. That looks all right. So the current that I was using was 1.23 amp to bring it back to the origin. And then I gave you also, I think that's all I needed uh, to get to this right here is square. Uh, e over M, yeah, E square over 2 V1, B square. I think I got everything that I needed. And um, let me see if there is anything else I need to give you. The other thing I was going to give you was that, uh, so, so N is what? Also the upper layer has 75 windings. Okay, 75 windings. And that's that. I want you to find the fractional difference with respect to E over M. And I used to do a, the Millikan oil drop experiment to find out the mass of the electron directly, but that was a much trickier experiment. And um, sometimes it was quite frustrating actually. And it's difficult to do it with a video experiment because you have to look through a microscope to see the oil drops uh, actually falling through. And you can't do this uh, with the video right now. So, so this is the best thing that we can, uh, uh, we can do. This is a, actually it's a Nobel Prize winning experiment. So if you are there in 1890s, 1895, 1900, if you had done this, you had got the Nobel Prize. But we are very far away from it. We're sending now probes beyond Pluto. So we need to do much bigger stuff 
to get to it. All right, I'll be seeing you in class. Thank you.